Hey, welcome back. I'm uh, dealing with one of those questions that uh, Faye likes to throw at me, uh, apparently coming out of the, um, the uh, I think she told me, the one of the uh, London schools. Um, and um, of course, a you know, modern art school. And uh, so, but her question is one that I thought, even though I don't really want to get into into uh, sort of, shall we say, quarrels with people that I don't have anything in common with. Um, and I don't mean Faye, but I do mean those art schools. I don't see much in common. It's still worthwhile sometimes to, uh, to make uh, observations, uh, to take questions just to clarify who you are, you know, or who I am, in, 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 as I think of it, when I'm doing my own uh, reviewing of that kind of material. So. Uh, Faye says, the best art has always been radical, innovative by necessity. The artist's need to overcome the inadequacy of the existing modes of expression and extremist, taking something's, something to its extreme. So it's interesting, the words you're using, because in the modern uh, era, dominated by the left with its tendency to to rather use words with double meaning and if you don't know which meaning they're using uh, you you get yourself into trouble but the word radical in these days uh, means something besides coming from the roots right but it, it inherently means coming from the roots right so if she means radical that way then you, nobody has to get alarmed nobody in the in the shall we say conservative school uh, because I could always say that uh, uh, the best art, meaning the best painting, by the way, I better discuss that. But, but I'm, I'm going to say this before I say, discuss the point of art. But the best painting has always been conservative and yet innovative. Okay, it's it's never been radical in the sense of cutting off the roots. And this whole discussion that goes on, which if you, and if you want to see my my uh, article called. Uh, 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 art and Revolution that I wrote way bunches of years ago before I knew even the first thing about writing. But not so it comes across okay. Um, but uh, you'll be able to find any number of points where there's a discussion about, uh, you know, uh, basically cutting yourself off from the past. And that's a classic left thing to do. But the best art has always been radical. Absolutely, if you mean coming from the very roots, that thing called, that, that even produced the idea of aesthetics, you know, that thing of beauty, truth, and goodness, right? That's the radical roots, uh, and and of course the representational is the, what we mean by truth in one sense. And then there's the truth of there's the truth of reality in the sense of whatever subjective you know subject stuff you're talking about. Um, there's several levels of that truth thing, but the beauty thing uh, uh, has also been there from that from that time. So. Uh, I tend to go too fast on these. I'm going to go back a second to the question of art. The best art has always been radical. The um, and forget about the word radical. The best art. Art. Art's a big word, but what the art schools do now is different from what, say, the museum school used to do. The museum school was originated as a a school of drawing and painting, and the beaux arts in, in 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 France was a school of drawing. These people didn't have all kinds of sort of extraneous ideas about art. And it looks like the art schools today have become schools of artifacts. They're producing things that could be said to be artifacts. And uh, it's, so they can take in that broad, 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 broad range. You know, uh, even the decorative arts were, were isolated to schools of decorative art. Uh, you know, and that comes up here in discussing um, Damien Hirst and what he apparently is doing today. But the uh, but this, but this long training. By the time you get to the to the end of the 18th century, has been a uh, 19th century has been has been that has been training in painting and drawing, not in all sorts of other deeper whatever deeper. You know, I mean, deeper is the wrong word, but more complex and more more. Uh, I don't know, more challengeable, shall we say, uh, uh, directions. Uh, and, you know, the idea that you can just say whatever and call it the same thing, we can't. I mean, so we've gone from being an art of beauty and truth and being an art of painting and drawing to being now an art of, or, and, and not, I would even include sculpture for now, but to, from that uh, to becoming an entirely different form or whatever you say goes. And it could be an art of the ugly, it could be art of the obscene, an art of the, 
of the gross. You know, this, this idea of shock your grandmother was an expression, it's an old expression about what not to do in our form. And of course, that is radical when people start doing that. It's not conservative, but that long, long, long history is conservative. Now, you could, you could attribute it to the, uh, to the West and the, uh, the, uh, the, the biblical base, you know, the, the, the faith uh, slash moral base in, the, uh, in, in, in the, both the Protestant and the, uh, and the non-Protestant uh, churches as well as the Catholic churches. So the best of art has always been, well, it's the best painting. And I'm only, I'm only going to talk about painting. I can't give you expertise on something I know nothing about in the world. And that world that they're in, I walk into an art school and I, wouldn't even, I would never, ever have gone to a place like that. That was not what I was after when I was a young man. And uh, I knew exactly what I wanted. And it is that long, it was connected with that long history that I just described. So, so then she says, in, the best art has always been radical, innovative by necessity. And... Um, she says, the art, quote, a parenthesis, the artist need to overcome the inadequacy of the existing modes of expression. Well, that would fit perfectly if you mean something like this, that we went from fresco in Italy to using oil paint or from casein and the tempera base, sort of tempera, sort of base paints, uh, egg tempera, to, to using oil uh, and to using exclusively oil because oil is so much a better medium. So yeah, it did, it did uh, do s numbers of things better. Uh, da Vinci's the guy who switched in this country. It was already being done in, uh, by, uh, by the Dutch. Uh, if not the Dutch, anyway, some of the northern countries. So, um, of course, so, th so there's a, there is that need to overcome those things. If that's what you mean, I agree with you completely. An extremist, taking something that's extreme, I don't even know what that means. I mean, doing a thing as well as you can would be one way of saying taking something to its extreme, but why, why is a word extreme needed, right? And does it simply do that double entendre thing of justifying like the word radical, justifying a whole lot of other sort of, sort of stuff, you know, that's never been part of our grand and unified history. So I'm showing you what, uh, she, she then suggests that I look at the works of Damien Hirst and his teacher at the, um, Royal College, I think, of Art in London. And that top piece is his teacher's stuff. It's pretty typical of his teacher's stuff. Uh, down below is what Damien Hurst, I think, is doing now. It looks like sort of viewing through a kaleidoscope. Uh, and uh, I know even before they were, it says in the writing around him that right, even before these young men uh, of his group uh, were out of school, they were hunting for ways to make a mark for themselves, to make money and all that sort of stuff. And I do wonder sometimes when I know there's a, there's some uh, Persian, is Persian the right word, uh, Arab money involved eventually in that school. And you wonder if that's part of the influence on this non-figurative, non, uh, 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 you know, art, you know uh, work. But uh, as I said, that's what he seems to be doing now. It would be very difficult for me to show you a fish in a tank and have us agree that that's in the lineage of painting, right? It just isn't in the lineage of painting. It, it's in some other lineage. Like, it fits more, I guess you'd say, in the lineage of, um, of uh, bug collectors, you know, botany or something like that, you know, and then therefore becomes an artifact. You know, these museums uh, uh, that collect, that, that buy up the collections of, 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 um, of um, you know, um, crickets or whatever from around the world. So, uh, so I don't know what any of that has to do with us. I'm not even showing a picture of that because it doesn't fit. Anyway, would you give me your opinion, your views, responses to these six points? And again, referencing a book now, I should say not again, but referencing Michael Craig Martin, who wrote a book, uh, what, uh, what About Art or something like that, uh, rather in the direction of what is art. Uh, and I guess he wrote it for his students. And he's written a number of other books. Uh, none of which I've read, so I'm not going to even begin to try to make any judgments about what he says. But she's saying that these come out of that. But um, she says, but for example, your talk on memory drawing from your rearview mirror relates very much to point four, work to bring the present moment to the conscious surface of the viewer's experience, to make them alive to the present moment. Uh, again, I, I, it's one of those things where you wish that somehow or other uh, the... the uh, <laughs> complexity, shall we say, of the, of the uh, more literary mind. Take something very simple and turn it into something enormously complex. But this has historically been the case in point four. 
you're not, you, the God's point was, it's not your job to, to, uh, to, to uh, see it, it's to make people see what you saw, right? It's not your job just to have observed it and to put something down, but to, to help people to see what you saw. Uh, would that we could have some simple language back again like that. And if that's all he means, then of course that would be it. But what is this alive to the present moment? I, in, our, in the long history, it just means making them see what you saw and the beauty of what you saw at that moment and, and really succeeding at, as best you can at bringing it to the, to the viewer. So, uh, so I'll probably skip point four, but here there are all the points and I'll try to talk about them and I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures. So if you, don't, if you wanna run away, I don't, <laughs> I won't fault you, but on the other hand, uh, uh, Face put some serious time and, and, and rightly into uh, warning responses to these. So I'm going to deliver for her as best I can, just strictly staying within the lines as I can uh, of my own thinking as it relates to painting and drawing, okay? Uh, so contemporary, here's a point. Contemporary artists honor those of the past by following their examples, not by aping their work. That's classic. There's nothing new there. Everybody agrees with that. Uh, do your own thing, <laughs> does say speak with your own voice and all those sorts of things. We've talked about it here before. Of course that's the case. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, of any value in, in somebody who becomes a little clone of some painter from the past. Um, every artist's work is ultimately about the experience of now, not the past or the future. Yeah, it's all it can be, and only in this sense though, in that the experience of now is what you're seeing with your eyes today. Now I'm talking about us as, as an impressionist, as a, an observer of painting in front of us, or even, or even for telling stories and that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm not, a, I'm not a, uh, uh, an illustrator. But the experience of now is a funny one because there's a long history of, uh, of great painting dealing with the past and the future, you know, the, the, the apocalyptic or the, but, but the past. So if, why should, uh, why must it be about the experience of now? not the past, the future. Well, if you mean the experience of it, you haven't experienced the past or the future, right? So does that mean you would like to outlaw? Or how, how would this guy bring his own experience to that? Well, that's all he could possibly do. He'd say, here I am, a 20th century guy, I'm gonna give you a last judgment. Just like, just like David did. I mean, David did, uh, Michelangelo did, right? So I don't know why you would want to, uh, if you're trying to limit that, but it certainly is your experience of it. It's your, it's your projection of it, and therefore you and contains the, the who you are today thing, right? Inevitably making it your voice again there in that sense. So it's, yeah, it's an experience of now in that limited sense, right? I know these people in these books mean a whole lot more than that. And I'm betting in the, it's based on the, on the uh, exhibitions I've seen. And I'm betting that the uh, concepts don't even begin to mean what I'm talking about, but it is where they come from. They originate with ideas that are very basic in our history. Uh, do I think this is, you know, radical in the sense that it's a root thing? You know, I would love to quote you, two, two um, roads diverged in a yellow wood by Robert Frost. This definitely is divergent when you start talking about what they eventually did with it in the modern art schools, which are modern. I mean, that's a hundred years of, of stuff that's trying to transcend 500 years and, and forever, actually, mankind going way back, way back, way back. So, uh, it's, so it's made for the present, even if it fails to be recognized or acknowledged right away. Uh, you know, that's, a, that's, that's one that I've always been taught otherwise. You make it for the present, but what you're trying to do is, 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 is contain the universal voice. And that's very different. In other words, you're speaking truth. It's not the same thing. People speaking, that's called time serving when you speak only for the present. But if your voice doesn't contain the long truth, it's the same thing when you're p hitting notes. You can hit a local color note and a local color note and make them all as tricky as you want, as nice as you want. Uh, but if they're not speaking to the whole and if they're not speaking to the long history of the human eye, <laughs> then you'd wind up with a little bit of a, of a problem with people enjoying it later on in, 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 in uh, potentially, I should say, later on in uh, generations or through other cultures. So, uh, it's, it, it's made for the present. Yeah, lots of work isn't recognized or acknowledged right away. Uh, the, when, I mean, that's the, why did Rembrandt uh, struggle to do, when he finally found his own way, why did he struggle to sell it, right? Or, did he, you know, uh, so, I mean, there are other questions involved about why he might have, but he might have dropped out of the market for that matter. <laughs> uh, so, and that's not my, my thing to talk about. I want my work to bring the present moment to the conscious viewer. Uh, making a lot, so I've already talked about that. And then the last one here, 
I hope I didn't lose one of these for you. I think an artist's work goes, gets most interesting when it's taken to its own inherent extreme. Well, what is that? You know when a guy nails it? So if you think that, if I'm trying to get you the quality of this light, I'm talking about something like Zorn painting that building. I don't have a shot of it. Oh, I might actually a little later. But, but, but uh, Zorn, in the, the trolley shot there where he's painting, uh, he's trying to paint light flex dominating humans. So he's actually organizing everything about, as an impressionist would, around the light. And he's pushing it to the point where, and he starts succeeding, he's actually become extremely successful with <laughs> doing it. And uh, so, but the idea of it getting most interesting, I suppose so, because it's becoming more and more and more itself. And the more you become your own self, that's say you see with your own eyes and you use your own, you know, you, you, you evolve yourself with your skills. Uh, the further you can get with what you're, what, you know, the, the better you become at expressing what you are and what you see, uh, the more interesting you're going to get in general. I don't think you can dispute that. I think those are wonderful points, Faye. But I'm going to just show you something here, and I'm going to ask you to be thinking about a, a dead fish in a tank, um, uh, the Damien Hirst, because that school, the show that she refers to, the young British artist or something, uh, is just full of that. Um, kind of thing, you know, cast of bodies and odd things like that. And it, of course, is all part of this long history of painting, you know, putting a cross in, 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 in urine and things like that, which, you know, the whole, the whole mass of thought there has nothing at all whatever in common in terms of its attitude toward life and toward other humans and toward uh, faith and toward goodness. Uh, I mean, not in all points, in all those points, but in so many points, right? So much so that, by the way, you walk into one of these places, and I remember seeing, in fact, not even walking into these places, just look at something called flash art or something, and you just, you can't look very long at that without feeling that you're somewhere between insane and, and going mad, you know, or going mad, or, or filthy, you know, you just, that, that, that's the feeling I get looking at those pictures and those books. I would never have wanted to become a painter, but this is the history, so I'm gonna show, just blink you through the history, okay? You see, we'll start with Giotto, but this, in this rough chronological order, but I'm just gonna show you the history and just get the feeling for it. Don't look hard at these guys. Just look at what you're seeing here, okay? Among other things, you'll notice design, right? You'll notice there are, there are efforts to design within a rectangle. Now, I showed you one of the, uh, 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 I think it's Hiroshigi, Hokusai? That's Hokusai. Uh, because to show you that this idea is universal, the idea of, of, the, of the unity of linear expression, for example, or color relations and that sort of thing, that's necess the great necessity of our form in painting. There's Malay and Ang at the top, and down below is Yudamaro um, uh, uh, on the left. And uh, again, you can see the same idea of color schemes, and uh, these guys are all similar in time and of, of design within the rectangle or circle or whatever oval. So it starts with a, uh, with a, uh, um, uh, yeah, how can I lose his name, uh, Leighton, and goes to, to Jerome on the right. And then down below the Leighton is a Moore, uh, Manet, and then uh, Regnault, young man who died, and who died as a young man, a very promising young painter. By the way, there's somebody painting the past or as Achilles, the, the horses of Achilles, rather, Automaton and the horses of Achilles. <clears throat> it's a huge painting, maybe 12 feet high, at least 10 feet high in the Museum of Fine Arts. It was rolled up when I, I asked them where, when they would show it. It was on the frontispiece of Gamel's book, The Twilight of Painting. And uh, then, of course, there's Monet Degas taking color, Monet taking color, to, bringing color to life as never before. Again, that's that thing about how is that not innovative, right? It's totally innovative, and yet it's not outside the mainstream. They're all trying to get deeper and more profound, truthful expressions of things that they saw, and then they would use them as Degas does, as as tools to 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 um, to uh, for a what I'd call an inventive art form. In the case of his, uh, you know, using uh, these uh, figures, uh, you know, I say inventive. I do mean you know, in that same sense, as imaginative, not painted from life. And then Waterhouse and Blashfield on the right. Blashfield was an American muralist. 
and you know Soroya and of course uh, De Camp on the right, and there's a sergeant and uh, and that Zorn I was referring to. So, but this gives you an idea of what the main scene. This goes right on through for those 500 years or whatever it is. It goes right on through. I think I guess my figures start at 1200, so it's it's more like uh, 600 plus years of history, right? And uh, so this goes right up to George Ennis and Dewing. This is the Boston School era. This is Paxton on the bottom right. That's a Matthews on the left, bottom. And this is uh, one of my favorite paintings in the Museum of Fine Arts uh, on, the, on the left there. And uh, uh, what is his name? Uh, oh, boy. Uh, this is not good that I'm losing that name. <laughs> I'd rather not. I included an Arpin down below and, uh, and, and a camp above. Um, Oh, that's not a good thing. It's not George DeForest Brush, but I connect him with him, so I've got his name in my head. But so that gives you the, uh, but that gives you a read on what then, and so I'm just going to jump you now to the first paintings, and you can, you can make of them what you want, but I said what I said about them in the first place, and that's why I'm really wanting to do this much more than, uh, you know, getting into arguments with people about stuff, you know, that isn't anything to what we do. But with the first things you look at with, um, with uh, Faye, the ones that she's really offering us that I put put out there, you're looking at at something that you can say is part of the mainstream because they're pictures and they're figurative. This, this is a figurative picture um, by um, by uh, Hirsch's teacher, and and you could even argue that the ones where he does these things look like they're done with kaleidoscopes. You know, it almost looks like he has a, a camera with a kaleidoscope lens and he turns the kaleidoscope and shoots. Uh, and I'm not saying he doesn't just make these up from scratch, but I, there were a number of the ones that he did that looked like things I've seen, absolutely seen in some nice kaleidoscope. I'm showing you, by the way, to the, this is an abstraction as well. This is uh, by, um, by the director of the uh, uh, MIT uh, department, art, art department. Um, uh, what is it, the visual studies, visual arts? I think it's called visual studies. But I show you this one by, um, by Georgi Kepish, a Hungarian uh, trained, Bauhaus trained, I guess, uh, Hungarian painter. But um, this one bridges, rather, what I'd like to say, three things. First of all, and by the way, I'm not taking anything away from the sense of beauty that these have their color relations and that sort of thing. They're, they're very pleasant and delightful, rather, in fact. But, but this one here brid bridges a fascinating gap. It, it rather looks like, if you look at a lot of Japanese paintings, it looks like a bridge. It looks like it could be a, a tonalist painting by by uh, Whistler, and uh, to the extent of it being a city or clouds or whatever, I, I'm just saying it has very suggestive, very evocative. It's also full of texture, and so. But it, but but so many of his, the ones I appreciate the most, the ones I get the most, uh, are evocative. And I actually asked Kepish about that once. Not this picture. I saw one with a some squares or whatever and some light here, and then a bunch of darks and all that stuff out there. And I said that so much evokes something. I said, are you trying to do that? And he said, and his, you know, painters would always say yes to a straightforward answer. But he said, he said that that was a product of what was in my mind about the visits I used to pay to my grandmother's place in Hungary. We would be on a sleigh going to for Christmas or Thanksgiving or well, it wouldn't have been Thanksgiving, it would have been Christmas. Uh, and we'd be going there and just I, the, when, through the woods, you'd be seeing the lights of their place. And I guess the excitement would build up and these memories were permanent in, in his mind. So to some very significant extent, they're, they're actually relational and they're also pleasant in my mind to the extent that they're also are suggestive, evocative in a poetic sense which neither of these are, but I'm not saying they should intend to be. I'm just saying that's one of those things that you can deal positively with abstract painting when it, when it does things for you that are, evoke you know, this, the, the truth in some, on some multiple levels. So, uh, yeah, so I'm not trying to, to do anything more than just tell you one little old thing, and that is painting is painting. And if I had, I probably should have picked it here, but this other thing the art schools are doing isn't painting. It's something else, right? So I just think of them as, you know, they call them art schools, I'd call them artifact schools. And they look like they're trying to create things that will belong in a museum. They have no other possible use, they'll belong in a museum. Uh, I say no other possible use, I mean, that's silly. And, but, but I don't know if any painter today uh, paints to paint to be in a museum. They paint to be on the walls of somebody's home and to be enjoyed and to, give, to enrich their, their lives and their homes. So, uh, and yet, of course, obviously, people are mixed motives. You'll find people that just want to get rich and other people that uh, couldn't care less about that. They just want to find out what is the very nature of this thing and, and uh, to do one of them well before they die. That sort of difference, you know, so. 
Anyway, well, thank you, Faye, for that question. Uh, I think I've covered the territory. Um, and uh, I just hope that everybody uh, can appreciate the, the also, you know, speaking to you, Faye, and to the people over there that are more, you know, part of the, uh, the new stream of whatever that is, you know, that I think is radical in the broken off sense rather than radical in the, uh, or in the shock your grandmother sense for the most part, than in the sense of coming from the roots of. But, but I still suggest that, you know, what you want to do when you're looking at painting is just uh, uh, don't include it in the world of artifacts. I mean, they happen to be artifacts because they're in museums. <laughs> But they're not artifacts, uh, not originally. That's not what was ever their purpose. They were there to decorate walls in either mural form or some other form. And, uh, and they were to tell stories in that uh, sense of the uh, sort of the Bible stories. Or they were, you know, they tended to be portraits in the same sense, though, that they would be, uh, as a, even as an uh, illustration, they would still be trying to be uh, conveyors of beauty, uh, either in, in pattern or in color relations or in some of those other kinds of key ways and multiples of those key ways, form. So, uh, yeah, I started here with Giotto, and I'm not sure I can even tell you all the names of these. Frangelico on the right, uh, I think it's Memling on the, is that Memling? Uh, maybe, I'm not really sure, and I've forgotten the names. And this is Perugino, and this is Botticelli, uh, just earlier than Da Vinci, and, and then Giorgione, who was nearer in time to Da Vinci. And then this is Van Eyck, I think, or is it Van Der Weyden? Anyway, but that couple guys there that were really doing the best with oil painting at that time. And uh, then, of course, uh, Michelangelo the, and the frescoes, you know, and here's a, here's a sculptor doing painting and complaining the whole time, <laughs> I guess. Uh, Titian on the right and, um, and um, uh, Holbein down left with a Raphael down right. I just doing this because we didn't name them and you guys might like me to. So Veronese on the left, Velasquez above. Rubens, by the way, that Rubens in that, uh, and, and Van, here's, here's Van Dyke, student of Rubens. Now, there's no way, he's, he's absolutely a student of Rubens. And all these guys, by the way, they look like their teachers before they become themselves. In other words, they fully take on the skills of their teachers and many of the mannerisms. But there's no way in the world you can confuse, at least I don't confuse ever a, a, a Van Dyke with a Rubens, even though they're using some of the same forms. And by the way, it's partially because the level of truth that Rubens, which is always that one of the goals, you know, for, for getting to the next level, uh, one of the goals of uh, of Van Dyck was more truth. You, you know, Kurt, this this what he does is his own figures, and he, he fortunately was getting further and further away from that idea of of having a, like your own sort of figure idea in your head. And you force all ladies and gentlemen into the figures you've made up in your head. This is Poussin over here. But so in that sense, you would be uh, you would be a, a step away. But you're and in that sense, you'd also be innovative, and you'd be but you also then be your own self, expressing yourself. And your times, if you'd like to put it that way, right? And by the way, in both cases, these guys are painting something that's totally not of their times. These are just imaginative paintings. How can you be of your times making something up in your head anyway, right? It's all you can do by, to be of your times is to actually be there and do it with your own hand and your own uh, awareness of things. And that's how you're of your times. So that's uh, Reynolds of the former teacher over there at the, uh, um, at the uh, Royal Academy. And Tieplo on the right, and uh, I want to tell you that is uh, Van Watto, I think, on the left. And then this is uh, Boucher. And then again, I think I've talked about, you know, Vermeer, uh, uh, Rembrandt, and, uh, and Chardin. And uh, yeah, but if you look at these thoughtfully, you'll, you'll know that this is a, there's a train. It's called beauty. Yeah. Beauty, truth, and goodness, if you want to apply the Keats thing. The good, the beautiful, and the true. That's the model. That's the that's the continuity. So you know, Ang Millet, uh, and then Bougro down the middle there, and Alfred Stebbins on the right. For those of you who have never seen Alfred Stebbins, I think that's in, at the um, at this wonderful museum, the Sterling Francine Clark Museum, and in, in, uh, with a bunch of others by Stebbins. By the way, somebody was a very aware buyer. And um, yeah, as Manet down the middle bottom. I don't. I think I did mention that. So. All right. Well, good, and I, I hope that's adequate for the discussion. And doesn't uh, and I just really do want us to uh, stay focused. I try to stay focused on just what is what is the good of what we do, and let's stay focused on doing that and not picking on anybody else or judging anybody else when you don't even know what they're doing or why. 
So uh, with that in mind, um, thank you, Faye, and, uh, and do come back. I'm sorry to hear about your, your mom uh, and uh, appreciate your patience in coming back and, and addressing more of these. So do take care, folks, and see you after a good painting week, okay? Oh, and I forgot to say, don't forget to donate if you can, subscribe, share, subscribe, share, yes, comment, there it is. Uh, and, um, and uh, yeah, there, all right, have a good one.